right, I would like to invite you to take your Bibles, and I'd like you to turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Children, yes, you may go to Children's Church. Awesome. All right. Let me turn on my iPad here and get to the Scripture. All right. Well, before we read this, what I'd like to do is give us a little context, because last week, Pastor Trent spoke to us, and today I'm going back to Hebrews. So it's been two weeks since we did Chapter 3. So let's recall what Chapter 3 was sharing. First of all, the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. It's written to Christian people, Christian people, who were in danger of giving up on Jesus. In their day, it was getting so very difficult to honor God at the workplace, on the streets, in the home. It was getting so difficult. The persecution was growing so intense that these people are just saying, hey, listen, I'm going to go back to my flavor of Judaism. I'm going to go back to Moses and the prophets. Following Jesus is just about to kill me. And I just can't do that anymore. And so this writer, and we don't know the, the writer of Hebrews. It's an unusual book because we, the author doesn't, doesn't reveal his name like most of the books like the Apostle Paul does. And so what do we have here? So what the writer does is he begins writing and he's, remember I showed you that picture of balancing encouragement and warning? <laughs> he's putting his finger up in their face and he's warning them because, listen, they're in danger of doing the dumbest thing nearly that they have ever done in their whole lives. And that is, as a child of God, to turn their back on Jesus and just close their lips. I'm not going to say his name in public. I'm never going to testify about him. I'm not going to confess him openly. Those days are over. And so they're in danger of turning their back. In fact, we're going to get to chapter 6 before long, and it says, you've trampled underfoot the blood of Jesus. You're in danger of doing it. I should say, they're in danger of doing it. They hadn't gotten there yet, but they were close. And he says, if you do that, if you trample underfoot the blood of Jesus, by which you were made holy, that the wrath of God, the judgment of God, yes, you're his child. But disobedience, God will judge. He will discipline his children. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. It says in the Old Testament, and it says it in later in the book of Hebrews, he's telling these people, encouraging them, warning them. And we're going to see that today. He encourages them, but he also warns them here with a stiff warning. Okay, so they needed to be careful because you know what they were about to do? They were about to do what their ancestors back coming out of Egypt did. God says, I want to give you an amazing blessing, Israel. I want to give you the promised land. I want to give you a special reward for obedience to me. But you have to go in and claim it. You have to enter that land and engage the people there in battle because it's your land. I've already set it aside for you. Guess what? They sent 12 spies. Only 10 of them, or only two of them, were obedient to God, Joshua and Caleb. 10 of them said, we can't do it. They're gigantic. They'll kill us all. And they were, had no faith in God, had no trust in what he has promised. God said, take it. It's yours. They were listening to God. Okay, and that, all of those people dropped dead in the wilderness. They never made it in to the promised land. In other words, they never got their rest. And by the way, there is a rest for you and I today from God, a special inheritance rest. And we're going to talk about it. We talked about it last time. We're talking about it this morning. It's not a, a land, not He's not telling us to go into a land and get it. I'll explain to you, of course, you already know what it is. It's the rest of being a co-ruler with Jesus. Not, not every, every Christian, Christian will be a co-ruler. And that's, that's going to be the thrust of what we're talking about. But first, let's read the scriptures together, okay? The ancestors of God's people that are being written to had disobedience toward God and a lack of faith in his promises. 
And, and so, so going, going back to chapter, chapter 3 first, verse, verse 18, the writer says to those New Testament, Testament saints, and to whom did God swear that they would not enter his rest? Think, Think about it, God. God's it's like putting his hand on a Bible. He doesn't need to. He just swears by himself because he's supreme. But he's, he's giving an oath. I promise. <laughs> I promise. To whom did God swear that they would not enter his rest? But, and notice what I have in red, to those who did not obey. Give me a Christian who won't obey God. And, I, and I'm not talking about us and our daily failures. I'm talking about ones that turn their back and never want to to ever say a word about Jesus again. They're angry and, and depressed and all bent out of shape. They don't obey. Verse 19 says, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They wouldn't obey and they weren't faithful. They wouldn't trust God's promises. So important. And we're going to see that today. Okay? Now, the reason I read that verse is because chapter 4 starts... Chapter 4 <laughs> starts, oh, and of course it jumps to, okay, with a therefore. So in, our, in your Bibles, when you're reading the Bible, and then there's a chapter break, it jumps to the next chapter, and it has therefore, just ignore this, because <laughs> he hasn't stopped talking. Because if I say something to you, and I just stop, then I stop. But if I say, um... Who could not enter in? The people who were unbelieving. They weren't trusting God at his word. Therefore, see, you know exactly what I'm doing. I said something, and I'm making a comment on what I just said. Okay, so what? They couldn't enter in, so what? Therefore, and he's talking now to God's people uh, about the promise God has for them, the special reward in heaven. Not for every Christian, but for those who obey, those who have faith. They walk by faith till the day they die. He has a special inheritance, a special reward. Okay, and what is it? Well, let's read here. Therefore, since a promise, who's, given, who's making this promise, everybody? God, since a promise remains. Notice that, remains. You're going to see that three times in this passage. Since a promise remains for you that are about to give up of entering his rest. Now, that doesn't mean going to heaven and laying on a hammock. This rest is co-ruling with Jesus. It's your special inheritance rest. You're going to be like, I got a crown with Jesus. <sighs> and, you know, it's kind of like you rest in that wonderful knowledge that you faithfully serve Jesus. Okay. Since a promise remains of entering his last rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, notice again, for, because, indeed, truly, the gospel, the good news. Okay, this is talking about the good news of this rest, not the good news of getting saved. Though the, that's good news too. God's got a lot of different good news for us. Indeed, the gospel the good news of this rest was preached to us, just like it was preached to them coming out of Egypt. But the word which they heard did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. There it is again. You have to trust in God. You have to have faith in God to get what we're talking about. God is very serious about this. He's not mincing words, okay? He says, this is the way it's going to be. Some people will hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant, and some Christians will not. They'll be in my kingdom forever, but they won't get that special reward that I'm calling, I'm inviting every one of my children to. Okay, now we're going to jump down to verse 11 because the verses in between those verses about, is about the stupidity of Old Testament Israel coming out of Egypt. Okay, we already talked about that. So verse 11 says, in light of Israel's stupidity, let us, and notice he includes himself, the writer is saying, let me and you all, New Testament Christians, let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, to get that special reward, lest anyone 
fall according to the same example of disobedience, old, like Old Testament Israel did. Why? Verse 12. Because the word of God is living and powerful. Okay? What he's saying is, look, you go against God's word, you're barking up the wrong tree. For the word of God is alive and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the human heart. Verse 13, And there is no creature hidden from his sight. Okay? None of us can hide. No Christian can hide. None of us can say, hey, you know what? Who am I? I'm a nobody. God doesn't care about me. If I don't walk by faith, if I don't live for him, if I don't strive for this prize, I don't really want that. I want a hammock. I don't want to rule with Jesus. You will when you see him. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is all Christians' judgment, that's different from the great white throne in Revelation 20, which is all unbelievers' judgment. When we stand before Jesus, just before his kingdom, at the judgment seat of Christ. See, he's going to, at that judgment, he's got all the Christians from eternity, or yeah, not, not eternity past, but from human history past, since Adam and Eve. Every believer is standing before him, and he's going to decide, will that Christian rule with me, or will they not? And in that day, when you have your glorified body, and you're perfectly sensitive to God and perfectly sensitive to sin, a lot of Christians today are like, ah, that's, that's for other people. I don't get no. In that day, you're going to be perfectly sensitive to God, and you're going to be like, oh, my goodness, what did I do? What did I do? What was I thinking? Because, everybody, this affects eternity. This affects that this is a reward that lasts forever. It's not like you're going to rule for 10 years. You are going to have authority forever and ever. It's just mind-boggling. I, you know, we can't even, we really can't even comprehend it in, in its fullest meaning, all right? So, nonetheless, there's no creature, verse 13, hidden from God's sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, to whom we must give account. We must give that account. We're going to give that account. I love verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Remember the subject of Jesus being our go-between with God? When we pray, when we need his strength, when we need his help, when we're being tempted, chapter 2. He's this great high priest. He's much greater than the Old Testament high priest was. He is the supreme high priest uh, uh, from the order of Melchizedek. And so since, or, or the verse says there, because, I'm sorry, let me go back to verse 14. I was jumping to verse 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, he's ascended to be with the Father, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast. There's the us again. The writer saying, I've got to hold fast. You've got to hold fast. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have, I'm sorry, changed. <laughs> For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. He was a human being. He was tempted in every way we are tempted. In other words, <laughs> okay. It doesn't mean every single way, but if you were to go across the board, he knew what it was like to be tempted. Obviously, there are things in existence today that weren't in existence then, okay? Temptations. But Jesus knew what it was like to be tempted in all things. You, you could be tempted to do this, to do that, to think this, to think that, so on and so forth. But he refused every one of them. He did not ever give in. So we have a high priest who relates to us. He knows what it's like to be tempted, to want to give up. He was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, because we have a great high priest, come boldly. It means 
come with confidence. I've got a great high priest. He's my go-between with God. I, go to, I, I come to the throne of grace, and, and I, I lift up, up my, my voice. voice. And, and Jesus, Jesus is there, there interacting with God the Father, and he's saying, Father, Father, hear the prayer of your child. I'm their elder brother, and I want you to listen to this prayer and to hear it and decide what you'll do with it. You know, you get the idea. He's going to bat. He's a go-between and a helper to, toward us. Come boldly, come with confidence to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy when we sin and find grace to help in time of need. Hey, when you're, when you're ready to give up, that's the time of need. <laughs> and so we find grace. What is grace? That's God's help, God's blessing to us. We cry out to him. I love what Hebrews says. It says that Jesus wept with vehement, I mean, he, uh, he prayed with vehement cries, intense cries to the Father, and with tears. Jesus knew what it was to be human and desperately need his father. And so we've got a great high priest that we can go to in time of need. Okay, let's jump in with a story, everybody. A management consultant and author named Ken Tucker wrote about the amazing lengths that human beings will go to to find or to obtain something of great value. I love this story. Bill Adams was the CEO of a large hospital in Virginia, and he received a frantic call from a woman. She said, my mother came into your hospital with her wedding ring, and now we can't find it, she said. I want to make an appointment to discuss this with you. So she gets the appointment. She goes to see the CEO of the hospital, and she said, at that meeting, that her mother had died a few days earlier of cancer, okay, just a few days before the meeting. And with tears in her eyes, she described how her mom and dad had been married for 50 years, what a wonderful couple they were, what loving parents they were. And she told the CEO how the day before that meeting, her dad, with tears in his eyes, had said to her, quote, it would mean so much for me to be able to slip that ring back on her finger before we bury her. He was crying. So, the woman continued, I was hoping that there was some way that you could help me fulfill his dream of putting that ring back on my mother's finger. Is there anyone you can think of who may be able to help us find that ring? Well, Bill Adams was deeply moved by this woman's story, and he was moved by her sad but her calm manner, and he promised to do all that he could to locate the ring, and he said this, Bill Adams said, in my heart, I yearned for a way to help them. And then he went on to say this, I left my office, stopped by the ward where the lady had spent her final days, the staff told me how she had lost so much weight in her uh, time there. And what they suspected was, was that the ring fell off because she had gotten so skinny and that it had fallen off her finger, maybe in the restroom, maybe uh, it, just in the sheets of the bed, the bedding. And so Bill Adams, the CEO of the hospital, personally, he goes and gets some help and they're looking over every single square inch of that room. Okay, obviously the bedding has been changed. They look at every square inch. They can't find it in the room. They go in the bathroom. They look everywhere. They're looking back around the toilet, the pipes and everything. They're trying to see, could it be here? Could it be behind the garbage can? Could it be in the garbage can? And so they're thinking all these things. Then he thought, you know what? I wonder if it fell in the bedding. And when they unrolled all that, it just got wrapped up. So believe it or not, the CEO goes to the basement and literally in the wet and grody and awful 
awful bedding and sheets and pillowcases and you name it, robes. Can you imagine? The CEO gets down in there and he looks everywhere. His hands are on all of that. I can't imagine. And he finds the ring. He finds the ring in the bin. And he said this, uh, I climbed into the bin and searched through the wet, soggy, dirty laundry. To my surprise, I found it. I cried. I almost, or he said, I almost cried right there and then. And he said, I will never forget the look. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> the look on that woman's face and on her father's face when I handed them the ring the next day. They were elated. They were elated. And you know what, everybody? That is a great story about the character trait of what? Of diligence. Of diligence. He searched high and low diligently to obtain what he wanted to obtain. And that is so crucial. You know, this is what keeps us going when everybody else has given up. And by the way, always keep in mind when I say things like that, I'm always, always, always implying with the Spirit of God's help and with Jesus' help, right? Because without him, we can do Okay. And so, diligence, though, diligence. In our text, God is telling his people, you need diligence. You're about to give up, and you need to put your nose to the grindstone, as it were, and with my help, keep on keeping on. Keep on going. Keep on striving. If you fall down, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You get things right and you keep going. Proverbs, the just person falls seven times and rises up again. Okay? You don't say, okay, I, I'm fed up. I can't do this. I'm getting beat to pieces by people around me. I'm, get, I'm, I'm just going back to the old way. It was easy. So, it's on this matter of diligence that I want us I want to speak to you for a few minutes this morning from Hebrews chapter 4, and here's the title. It's a, an exhortation. Be diligent to co-rule with Christ. Be diligent to co-rule with Christ. Let's bow our heads for prayer, everybody. Father, I pray that you will use your word in our hearts and lives today, Lord, be glorified, Father. Oh, Father, how we just ask for your power to be manifested in our midst. Lord, you tell us in Revelation that you walk among the churches. And Father, today, Lord, in Lord Jesus, today I pray that as you walk among us, I pray that you'll be glorified with how we listen and how we take this into our lives and live it out. And we pray it in your precious name, Lord Jesus, and for your sake. Amen. It was the great Bible teacher, Chuck Swindoll, the great author, who once said, we are all faced with innumerable opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. I could just hear him saying that. I love his voice. <laughs> Yours truly, I just inherited the Chicago Yankee voice. And so I've got a really kind of weird voice for Texas, but I love Chuck Swindoll. He was born in Texas, grew up in Houston. And you know what? Chuck Swindoll, when he's, you know, it's just a mag magnificent voice, but he says, we are all faced with innumerable, countless opportunities, brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. Wow, what a great quote. And you know what the Christian people to whom the book of Hebrews was written needed to know that the seemingly impossible situation that they found themselves in as they tried to run the race for Christ was actually a wide open door to opportunity that God has set before them. The opportunity to rule 
with his son Jesus in his eternal kingdom. You see what Revelation says here? To the one who overcomes, Jesus says, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I, as I also overcame, don't forget, that's the Greek word where we get our word Nike, like the shoe. Victory. To the one who is victorious, not to the one who, who caves and gives up. To the person who is running the race, and they're running the race. They fall down. Last night on Facebook, I saw a girl in a, like a 400-meter race, and she's out there running, and she trips, and she falls flat on her face, and everybody leaves her in the dust. And guess what? She gets up. She, she starts running right away, and she's boogieing, and she's boogieing. And it's unbelievable. She's passing all these seven or eight other, and she comes around, and at the last second, she beats the person in front and wins. She literally falls down in this race where you don't win if you fall down. You might as well just walk off. But she actually wins it. Well, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> we're talking about you fall down. You say, hey, Lord, forgive me, Lord. I, I hate my sin. And you get up and you start running again. You run and run. And then you know what? As you get older, some of you are older. And now you're starting to see the finish line. You're starting to see that ribbon. Say, Keep going. Keep going. Because you know what? If you break through that, it doesn't mean you're perfect. It means you never gave up. You kept confessing your sin. You kept going for Jesus. You kept loving him and serving him the best that you could with his help. And you know what? You cross that line like that, and he says to the one who's victorious, overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also was victorious. He didn't give up. Hey, thank God, amen. Thank God the night before uh, the cross, he didn't run away to another country and say, forget it, I'm not going through that. These people all betrayed me. They took off running. I'm out of here. You get the idea. Jesus says, I also was victorious, and I sat down with my father on his throne. But that's to the one who is victorious. It's not to the wimp. It's not to the, to the disobedient. It's not to the faithless person, the disloyal person, the one that can't walk by faith. We have to walk by faith. God makes us a promise in his word, and we just take it at face value. Okay? Let me give you a for instance. Everybody should be giving to the local church because we support missionaries. We pay Mother's Day out teachers, we pay the pastors, we pay for people to glorify God here at this church. Now, here's the thing. Not everybody can give what other people give. But you know, it just astounds me that a lot of people give nothing. They give nothing. Zero. And that's, that, see, that's just not right. Everybody should give something. And then, you know, maybe... You put your faith in God and Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do this. He says, don't worry, I got you covered. I love generous people, right? Doesn't it say that in the Bible? The Lord loves a cheerful, hilarious giver. <laughs> and you know what? By the way, everybody, this is kind of off my subject, but, you know, if you'll look in the bulletin, our offerings have been kind of low. I wonder if everybody thought, wow, they got such a great Christmas offering, we don't need to give everything. But that was helping us cover in a lot of ways for things from last year. You know, you get the idea, okay? And so what I'm saying is this, is that I know it's insane what stuff costs now. I mean, food and, and now car insurance and uh, home insurance, everything's skyrocketing. They've canceled the church insurance. I'm trying right now. It ends in April, I believe. And I'm calling, I'm trying to find other people to insure the church because now they're saying, hey, we don't want to we don't want to cover churches in Texas because you guys have too many tornadoes. You're killing us. State Farm, they paid 18% last year above um 18% above what they brought in from all the people's monthly payments because of all the catastrophes, floods, hurricanes, and you, you know what I mean? So they had to dip into the savings just to pay everybody what they needed to recover. And, and so what I'm saying, everybody, is this. 
in our church, we don't hang you over hell and say, hey, if you don't give, you're not really a believer, you're a crook, and, uh, and you're a God robber, and you're going to hell. That's not what the Bible teaches. But we do encourage everybody to give, okay? And we want you to know that. Hey, listen, God has taken care of this little church for decades now. Year after year, year after year, he blesses us. He keeps us going. And even after we've lost so many members, they've gone home to be with the Lord, and others have moved, and others have, have uh, uh, gone to other churches over the years. Listen, you know what? We keep going. We keep sharing the gospel. We keep people on the mission field. We keep them funded. And you know what? When you see Jesus, he's going to say, listen, you know what? I'll bet you any money some of them will be walking down the street and say, hey, you don't know this, but you know your church that you went? They supported me as a missionary. You've never met me, but you know what? Let me tell you what we were able to do because you were faithful. Isn't that awesome? It's going to be wonderful. Okay, so God set this wide open door before us, and those people needed to know that. This wasn't just, this isn't just like, uh, as Trent would say, eh. You remember Trent, he likes to say that, eh. No, this isn't, eh. This is like the most serious thing we can imagine in our lives whether we reign with him forever or whether we don't. We're all his children who have put our faith in him for eternal life. Everybody will enter the kingdom. That's absolutely free. Eternal life is free. Reigning with Jesus is extremely costly because you have to overcome on his behalf and with his help to the end of your life, to your dying breath, okay? You can't like in the last four months because you have cancer say, Look what I do. I give to God and I serve God. And what does he do? He's taking me away from my children and grandchildren and so on. And you know, and a person gets bitter and dies that way. Listen, they could have served Jesus for 60 years. And if in the last four months they turn bitter and cross their arms in their hospital bed and just turn away from, they will not reign. They will be rewarded for what they did. In those 60 years, because you're laying up treasure in heaven, Matthew chapter 6. But they are not going to get the supreme reward of ruling with Jesus. Why? Because they weren't an overcomer. In fact, uh, 226 and 27, you might want to write that reference down in Revelation. Read that. Because Jesus says, whoever overcomes and keeps my works till the end, I will give you authority over nations. Wow. So I know right now, some of you are thinking, eh, I just want to go to heaven and, and just sit in a hammock and tend my garden and, you know, that kind of stuff. But no, we got to get serious about what God's saying to us in his word. We have to say, you know what? This is the God honest truth. This is scripture. And even though 95% of the churches don't even know about this idea of ruling with Jesus, or they think, or they think, Every Christian's going to rule with Jesus. Uh, wrong. The book of Hebrews says over and over and over. And the rest of the New Testament, that's not true. <laughs> I can show, I can sit here for two hours and show verse after verse. Okay. So this door of opportunity is being opened to God's New Testament children. But many of them thought this opportunity was gone. And I want you to notice verse one because there's a little bit of a. Um, a little bit of a change I'm going to make to the last part of this verse because the way they translated it is kind of uh, stilted. It's kind of like awkward, the way it got translated. And by the way, the reason is, is in the New King, King James and the Old King James Version of the Bible, they're trying to stay, uh, what do you want to say? If you, if you just translate other languages by exactly the word, it, it can be very stilted. It, it's like, okay, I'll give you for instance. In Spanish, when I was in high school, one of the things that we learned was, it's they, we learned this phrase that says, me aprietan mucho los zapatos. Okay? Me aprietan mucho los zapatos. And that means my feet are killing me. Okay? But that's not what, if you look at those words, exactly what those words say, it says, to me squeeze much the shoes. To me squeeze much the shoes. Well, we don't talk that way. We don't sit down and say, 
to me, squeeze much the shoes. <laughs> you're sitting in your chair and you're getting your shoes. No, we say, we use, you know, everyday ordinary language, which isn't exactly what the words mean that we're saying. I feet are killing me. So you get the idea. In Greek, it's the same way. So what is it? Therefore, notice, everybody, in reminding you about your ancestors and in coming out of Egypt that dropped the ball big time for God and their bodies fell, they never got the promise. Never got that special reward from God. An earthly one, yes, we're talking about a heavenly one. Now he's talking to his New Testament saints, therefore, since a promise remains, hey, God's still reaching out to you with that open door. God's still reaching out to you with this promise. It remains of entering his rest, of entering co-heirship with Jesus. Let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. That's kind of stilted. Here, let me put up the next slide. Let us be careful that none of you think that you have missed it. You haven't missed it yet. You haven't forfeited that reward yet. But if you keep going in that direction, <laughs> you're going to make the worst mistake you've ever made in your life. You turn your back on Jesus and go back to your old ways, even if they're religious old ways. You're cruising for a bruising. The bodies of those people fell. And, and what, Jesus, what the writer is inferring, of course, is that you could experience premature death. You can go before your time because God may just be angry enough to say, you know what, I was going to let so-and-so live to be 85, but in the last five years, they've been, you know, uh, they've been walking in total opposition to me. You know what, I'm going to give them a few more years. I'll, get, I'll, I'll let them live to 70 Say, Pastor Bob. Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord, respect for God, prolongs days, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Now, I know that's proverbial. Proverbs mean it doesn't always happen that way, but most of the time. Most of the time, if you lay down with the dogs, you're going to get up with the fleas, okay? It's proverbial, but it's possible. So they needed to know that none of them had missed it yet. God was still opening that door. He says, the, 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 the promise remains to you, verse 1. So that leads us to our first lesson, okay? God's offer of rest. And don't forget, in Hebrews, when you're thinking of rest, it's, if it's in the context of Old Testament, Israel, it's going to be the promised land going in and having their own geographical area, their own property, for us, that rest is co-ruling with Christ, co-reigning with Christ, being his co-ruler. It's still available to his people, okay? And that's repeated notice, and I should be pointing this way. I'm looking back at mine. Uh, verse 1, verse 6, verse 9, remains, 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 okay? And, uh, and I'll show it. In fact, I'll show it to you. Verse 6, it remains that some must enter it. Notice some, not all. It remains that some must enter it. And those to whom it was first preached, Israel, did not enter because of disobedience. They were turning their back on God and his promise. Verse 9, therefore, or I'm sorry, there remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Three times, when, when, when you read a passage and something's repeated three times, that's important. And it's important for you to know you can't be looking back and say, oh, I've failed God so much in my past. It's not even worth me trying to go forward for him. Oh, yeah? Jesus said, he told a parable about a landowner who hired people at 6 in the morning. And the people he hired at 6 in the morning, they haggled over how much they would earn, right? And finally, they agreed. Okay, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, you're going to get a denarius for this day, I, I think. I can't remember. So then he hired people in the middle of the day, at noontime, in the afternoon. And then one hour, at 5 o'clock in the evening, they worked 12 hours, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. 
At 5 o'clock in the evening, he hires people, and they don't haggle with the master. They say, hey, give me whatever's fair, and they go out there, and they work for him for an hour. Now, all the employees come around. They got paid daily, okay? And the master starts with the people that started at 5 o'clock, and he gives them a, he gives them a, a denarius, I believe. Is that right? He, well, I can't remember. But nonetheless, when, when the people that were there since 6 a.m. see that they got, yeah, if they got a, a denarius for one hour, they're thinking, I work 12 hours. I'm going to get 12 denarii. But guess what? Everybody got the same. And, and they're just, they just can't believe that. But what God said is, hey, I'm a gracious God. And if I decide that this person here who works so diligently with me for an hour at the end, I can choose to bless that person if I see fit. Okay, now again, I don't want to take that and say, oh, Pastor Bob, that means if I work for 80 years and some only, other guy only works for four years, <laughs> that that guy might get, no, I don't think so. I think Jesus was trying to get a point across here. The point was this. Anybody that comes in toward the end of the day of human history before Jesus returns, and they, they've been messing up as a believer for the, most of their life, but at the end, man, they start running for Jesus, and they finish well. Now, they would not, they're not going to get anywhere near the rewards they would have gotten. But guess what? They will, in some way, will probably be a small way, but in some way they're going to, to um, rule with Jesus. Okay? Because they were faithful to the end. Okay? They started running, and they kept it up till they finished. And so that's all in God's hands, though. All we're saying is this. God is very, very, you know, we're talking about diligence today. He's very... Uh, what word am I looking for here? It's very important to God that we be people of diligence with his help. Keep on going. Keep on going. Endurance, diligence, faith. You got a lot of different qualities. Okay, so first, we got to be careful that we don't say, it's too late, I'm not going to get that, and so forth. And the reason for that is in verse 2. Okay, and I've got to go quickly here. The gospel which I told you earlier, here, the good news of ruling with Jesus, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them in the Old Testament, but the word which they heard did not profit them being mixed, not being mixed with faith. They didn't believe. They didn't take God at his word. They didn't believe that they could conquer their enemies in that land, and God told them they would. Just go and do it, and I'll make sure you get the victory. I think that's true today. Hey, just go out and live obediently to me, and I'll help you. Man, you start shaking or faltering, or you're tempted, I'll be there, I'll help you. Trust me. Have faith in me. Okay, for, uh, lesson number two. Ongoing faith in God is necessary to obtain the co-rulership with Christ God offers. They didn't mix it with faith. They just wouldn't take God at his word. You say, Pastor Bob, what is faith? It's just simply taking God at his word. Okay? He makes us a promise, and we say, Lord, I'm going to live in light of that promise. Because all promises, those promises in God's word, they all are, well, I should say all of them, but many, many promises are addressed to you and me, and many of them have to do with reigning and ruling with Jesus. Okay? God's people in Hebrews were beginning to look like their ancestors. They're faltering. The, the end of Hebrews says their arms spiritually are hanging down and their knees are wobblings. So they're spiritually not doing well. And that, when we start doubting what God said to us, what are, what are we doing? We're committing the sin of unbelief. How many of you believe unbelief is a sin? Okay. How many of you believe Christians can be unbelieving? Yeah, that's right. This is a bad place to be. Why? Verse 3. 
for we who have believed, and there's another place where there's a, really a better rendering. They rendered a past tense there. He's talking to the people who have already believed, and he says, for we who have faith, we who trust in God right now in our lives, we walk by faith. It's not saying, oh, we've already believed in Jesus. No, we, for we who have faith, do enter that rest. He's getting a point across to them. They didn't mix. They were disobedient. They didn't mix faith with what they heard from God. And he says, we who have faith do enter that rest. Okay? He's trying to get across to them. And, hey, keep trusting him. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Okay? Look at verse. Look, notice this faith weaved through the whole book of Hebrews here. Hebrews 6.12. This theme of faith. Do not become sluggish. <laughs> you know what that is. You know, you're lazy, dull. Don't become lazy, but imitate those who through faith and endurance inherit the promises. That patience is the word endurance nowadays. 1038. Now the just shall live by faith. Okay? Justified people shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, God says, what, turn, what happens if a person's running the race and they turn around? If anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in them. They make me angry, rightfully so. God is a God of anger, and he's rightfully so. When people turn their backs and trample his son's blood under their feet, they turn away. Look at 11.6. Wow, this is awesome. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. This isn't written to unbelievers, though they need faith in Jesus for eternal life. This is written to believers. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he exists. Okay, there's number one. I've got to believe that God is, that he exists. What else? Two. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently. What are we talking about in this sermon today? Diligence. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And in verses 4 to 11 here in Hebrews 4, the writer reminds God's people of the Jews coming out of Egypt. They wouldn't listen. They hardened their hearts. They disobeyed him. And because of this, they forfeited the land flowing with milk and honey that he wanted them to have. Now, I'm jumping down to verse 11. We, we know the historical. We don't have to read that. Let us, therefore, in light of Israel's failure, be diligent to enter that rest of ruling with Jesus, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. What happened to the people in, of Israel? They, their carcasses fell. Their bodies fell in the wilderness. They were, they were taken home prematurely. And he says, that could happen to you if you turn away. This is number three, lesson three. So we must be diligent. Okay, I just read it to you. Be diligent to enter that rest. Be diligent to get that reward from God. It's not free like eternal life. This costs you something. This costs you. Hey, do Olympic runners, do Olympic swimmers, do Olympic uh, um, what? hockey players, curlers, you could go down the list. Do they, do they just win gold medals just because they entered? <laughs> They've got to be diligent day by day, week after week, month after month, year after year. They have to pay a price with God's help. So we must be diligent to obtain co-rulership with Christ or failure is certain. If you get sluggish, if you give up, you'll, you'll fail. Hebrews 3.17. Now with whom was he angry? See, God can be angry. Who was God angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned? See, when you don't listen to God, when you don't take him at his word, you don't obey his pro you don't you don't believe his promises, that's sin. Who was God angry with? Those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness. So 
He says, listen, if you're like them, disobedient, no faith in God, scared, full of fear, then you will fall, you'll, you'll fail, you'll fall like your ancestors did. Okay? Jesus told us that we've got to pick up our cross daily and follow him. He said that for a reason. He didn't say, take up your cross of suffering. Um, he didn't say, take it up, whatever you feel like it. He says, no, this is serious. We're talking to disciples. We're not just talking to uh, uh, children that are real young and they can't comprehend this yet. They will be able to grow eventually as believers in Jesus and they could understand this. This is, this is going to be for people who are serious with God and that will take it at face value and say, oh, that's, that's really nice. They won't, or they won't say, yeah, that's really nice, Pastor Bob, and blow it off. Okay, this is diligence, okay? The life that pleases God. And that's why in verse 13 it says, the one to whom we must give an account. Why did God put that in there? To motivate them. He's trying to encourage them, to motivate them. And listen, don't forget you're going to give an account to this God who's calling you to this incredible reward. So don't give up. So let's wrap it up, everybody. Verses 14 through 16, he balances all this warning. Be diligent. And he's pointing his finger at them. Don't you get lazy. Okay. Now he balances it with encouragement. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest. And by the way, the confession there is their public stand. See, people who turn their backs on Jesus, they're not going to tell others that they love Jesus. They don't, have any, they don't have any desire to do that. They're happy going off their, in their own way like the prodigal son. Let us hold fast our public stand for Jesus, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize. Let me reverse that so it's easier to understand. For we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses as humans, because he was a human. That's the kind of high priest we have. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So let us therefore come boldly with confidence, boldly, same thing, to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. You can go to your high priest. Don't say, oh, this is so overwhelming, I'll never be able to do it. Baloney. You have a great high priest. He can see you through every problem, every pain, every suffering, all the persecution, everything you endure. He'll see you through every bit. You can go to his throne and find mercy for when you fail and find grace to help at the very moment you need it. And in this context, it's talking about temptation. I'm ready to give up. You can find the help you need from your high priest, okay? And so, uh-oh, my, my thing went way off the mark here. Let's see, let me get back to it. I, was, I think I was about to give you one more lesson here. Okay, yes, and then I'll give you a final story. Here's the final lesson. We must turn to Jesus for his help in times of need. Very simple. You've got a great high priest, turn to him. Do you think, I can't do it? I can't go all the way? I can't, I'm not a marathon runner? I can't go the distance? Yes, you can, because marathon runners on earth can do it, and they're getting a silly gold ribbon, or a silly gold medal with a ribbon on it. And we're shooting for a prize that lasts for eternity and it's having the highest honor a servant a disciple of jesus could have in the presence of jesus oh my goodness we all need to get serious about this and by the way those of you who are out there and you live around here and you're just sitting in bed with your pajamas on watching this and you could be here shame on you shame on you you should get serious for God. And you know what? I'm thankful you're watching me. Don't get me wrong. I'm thankful when, when you give to the church. But listen to me. That's not all there is to be in his disciple. 
watching a television show and plunking down money in an offering plate. All right, I got that out of my system. <laughs> and I'm not going to give up on you. <laughs> All right. No matter how difficult our lives may get, Jesus will always be there. He'll never leave us or forsake us. All right, final story. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie. It is wonderful. It's old. 1989, Robin Williams was just a kid when he did this with, uh, and it was a serious one. You know, he's normally, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hilarious, but this was pretty serious because he was a, a professor in a high school. Okay, let me, let me read to you the story I wrote here. This movie is about a controversial English teacher named John Keating. That was uh, Robin Williams' name in the, in the um, movie. He shakes up a New England prep school for boys in the 1950s. While at the Helton Academy, Keaton, played by Robin Williams, introduces his students to the classic poets. Classic poets. Inspired by their teacher's example, the boys resurrect a society of dead poets, the Dead Poets Society, that Keating, Keating established when he was a student at that school. So on the first day of school, Mr. Keating, Robin Williams, walks into class and he's whistling the 1812 Overture. <laughs> okay, so he's whistling the 1812 Overture, and immediately his students recognize, oh my goodness, this is his first time as a teacher. They said, this guy is different. You know, because they had the, the old school guys that were really boring and they filled the blackboard and all that. Well, nonetheless, he's, he's on fire and he's totally different. And he says, follow me, follow me. So they wallow him out into the hallway and they're standing in front of the trophy case. And a student reads aloud a famous poem about the brevity of earthly life. And then Keaton, Keating, the teacher, proceeds to interpret that poem. He says, Gentlemen, we are food for the worms. Believe it or not, each and every one of us in this room is going to one day stop breathing cold, turn cold, and die. And then motioning to draw a little closer to the aged photographs in the trophy case of the students from decades and decades before, he says this, I'd like you to step forward over here and to peruse some of the faces from the past. Look at them. You've walked past them many times, but I don't really think you've ever looked at them. They're not that different from you, are they? Same haircuts, full of hormones, just like you. Invincible, just like you feel. Their world is full of hope, just like you. But the question is, did they wait till it was too make or too late to make from their lives even one iota of what they were capable? Because you see, gentlemen, these boys are now, are now fertilizing daffodils. If you listen real close, you can hear them whispering their legacy to you. And as the boys draw close, their nose is practically pressing against the glass of the trophy case. Mr. Keating stands behind them and he whispers this to them. Carpe diem. Carpe diem. Seize the day. It's so moving. And my friends, God is saying the exact thing to every one of us. Carpe diem. Seize the day. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Jesus may return soon. God may call us home. Seize the day. Listen carefully to what God's saying and believe it. Be diligent so you can rule with Christ. Don't turn away. Don't make God have to punish you like he punished those who failed to obey him in entering the promised land. Don't be afraid. Walk by faith in God and come boldly to his throne of grace for the help you need. Why? Because it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. 
it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. A promise remains of entering his rest. It's for you. Carpe diem. Cease the day. Be diligent, the writer says, to enter that rest and be diligent to seize the day. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, your word is like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Oh, Father, how I pray. I pray for your people, Lord. I pray that they will be diligent, that they won't think like, you know, I'm just going to try to get the the least amount, I'm going to give the least amount of energy and strength to God's work, to his kingdom. I'm going to give the very smallest amount that I can possibly give in the offering plate to his, so on and so forth, Father. Lord, let us as your people say, no, Lord, I want to be on fire. I might not be the greatest organizer I might not be the greatest so and so such and such I say I mean but Lord you will take us we're just jars of clay you're the potter you can mold it into a beautiful thing that will bring, bring you glory for eternity so Lord have thine own way Lord have thine own way thou art the potter I am the clay and we pray this in your precious name, Jesus, and for your sake. Amen.